Hello everybody. Good evening. How are we doing? <laughs> Gotta be terrible towards me, a terrible person like me. Who speak? Good, it's fine. Hey Riddy. I hope you're having a wonderful night. It's been a cray cray day for me. Um, not necessarily bad, just sort of all over the place, but I'm happy to be home. Um, we have two more sections of book to read. I will do them today and tomorrow. Um, and then we will be all finished with this series. So, um, I will be doing three chapters tonight and four chapters tomorrow. And we will be all set. I thought about doing four tonight and then three tomorrow, but I think because it's later in the evening for me and I don't want to be up very late, I'm going to do three tonight and four tomorrow. Hello, hello Paige, how are you? So, today we'll be reading chapters eight, nine, and ten, and then we'll be all set. Hi Celeste, I hope the studying goes well and I wish you luck on your exam. Hello, I know you've never known me, but I've been keeping up on YouTube, I'm a big fan. Hi Trey, it's nice to meet you. Thanks for being here. I'm glad you've been enjoying the series. I hope you get to enjoy it live. I have not put book I have not put part two up on YouTube yet, but you can watch it here on my Twitch channel. I recorded that two nights ago and I plan to upload it after this stream to YouTube. So this is actually part three that you're hearing live right now. Um, but part two is in my Twitch videos from two nights ago. But it's great to have you. Hope you're having a great night or day, or whatever time of the day it is where you are right now. <laughs> okay, just wanted to make sure that you knew, um, so that if you had watched part one on YouTube, you weren't super confused going into just part three with a few chapters missing. Just wanted to make sure that I didn't confuse anybody, but okay. It's great to have everybody here. I appreciate you all very much. I'm going to go ahead and jump right into chapter eight as soon as I clear my throat, so excuse me. <coughs> Okay. Chapter 8. Thinking about something is like picking up a stone when taking a walk, either while skipping rocks on the beach, for example, or looking for a way to shatter the glass doors of a museum. When you think about something, it adds a bit of weight to your walk, and as you think about more and more things, you're liable to feel heavier and heavier until you are so burdened you cannot take any further steps and can only sit and stare at the gentle movements of the ocean waves or security guards, thinking too hard about too many things to do anything else. As the sun set, casting long shadows on the coastal shelf, the Baudelaire orphans felt so heavy from their thoughts they could scarcely move. They thought about the island and the terrible storm that had brought them there, and the boat that had taken them through the storm, and their own treachery at the Hotel de Numont that had led them to escape in the boat with Count Olaf, who had stopped calling out to the Baudelaires and was now snoring loudly into a, in the birdcage. They thought about the colony, and the cloud the islanders had put them under, and the peer pressure that had led the islanders to decide to abandon them, 
and the facilitator who started the peer pressure, and the secret apple core of the facilitator that seemed no different than the terrible items that had gotten the Baudelaire's in trouble in the first place. They thought about Kit Snicket and the storm that had left her unconscious on top of the strange library raft, and their friends, the Quagmire Triplets, who may also have been caught in the same stormy sea, and Captain Wittershin's submarine that lay under the sea, and the mysterious schism that lay under everything like an enormous question mark. And the Baudelaire's thought, as they did every time they saw the sky grow dark, of their parents. If you've ever lost someone, then you know that sometimes when you think of them, you try to imagine where they might be. And the Baudelaire's thought of how far away their mother and father seemed, while all the wickedness in the world felt so close, locked in a cage just a few feet from where the children sat. Violet thought, and Klaus thought, and Sunny thought, and as the afternoon drew to evening, they felt so burdened by their thoughts that they felt they could scarcely hold another thought, and yet as the last rays of the sun disappeared on the horizon, they found something else to think about, for in the darkness they heard a familiar voice, and they had to think of what to do. Where am I? asked Kit Snicket, and the children heard her body rustle on the top layer of books over the snoring. Kit, Violet said, standing up quickly. You're awake. It's the Baudelaire's, Klaus said. Baudelaire's, Kit repeated faintly. Is it really you? A naze, Sunny said, which meant in the flesh. Sorry. Where are we? Kit asked. The Baudelaire's were silent for a moment and realized for the first time they did not even know the name of the place where they were. We're on a coastal shelf, Violet said finally, although she decided not to add that they had been abandoned there. There's an island nearby, Klaus said. The middle Baudelaire did not explain that they were not welcome to set foot on it. Safe, Sunny said, but she did not mention that decision day was approaching and that soon the entire area would be flooded with seawater. Without discussing the matter, the Baudelaire's decided not to tell Kit the whole story, not yet. Of course, Kit murmured. I should have known I'd be here. Eventually, everything washes up on these shores. Have you been here before? Violet asked. No, Kit said, but I've heard about this place. My associates have told me stories of its mechanical wonders, its enormous library, and the gourmet meals the islanders prepare. Why, the day before I met you, Baudelaire's, I shared Turkish coffee with an associate who was saying that he'd never had better oysters Rockefeller than during his time on the island. You must be having a wonderful time here. Janiceps, Sonny said, restating an earlier opinion. I think this place has changed since your associate was here, said Klaus. That's probably true, Kit said thoughtfully. Thursday did say that the colony had suffered a schism just as VFD did. Another schism? Violet asked. Countless schisms have divided the world over the years, Kit replied in the darkness. Do you think the history of VFD is the only story in the world? But let's not talk of the past, Baudelaire's. Tell me how you made your way to these shores. The same way you did, Violet said. We were castaways. The only way we could leave the Hotel de Numa was by boat. I knew you ran into danger there, Kit said. We were watching the skies. We saw the smoke and we knew... You were signaling us that it wasn't safe to join you. Thank you, Baudelaire's. I knew you wouldn't fail us. Tell me, is Dewey with you? Kit's words were almost more than the Baudelaire's could stand. The smoke she had seen, of course, was from the fire the children had set in the hotel's laundry room, which had quickly spread to the entire building, interrupting Count Olaf's trial and endangering the lives of all the people inside, villains and volunteers alike. And Dewey, I'm sad to remind you, was not with the Baudelaire's, but lying dead at the bottom of a pond, still clutching the harpoon that the three siblings had fired into his heart. But Violet, Klaus, and Sunny could not bring themselves to tell Kit the whole story. Not now. They could not bear to tell her what had happened to Dewey, and to all the other noble people they had encountered. Not yet. Not now, not yet, and perhaps not ever. No, Violet said. Dewey isn't here. Count Olaf is with us, Klaus said, but he's locked up. Viper, Sunny added. Oh, I'm glad Ink is safe, Kit said, and the Baudelaire's thought they could hear her smile. That's my special nickname for the incredibly deadly Viper. Ink kept me good company on this raft after we were separated from the others. The Quagmires? Klaus said. You found them? 
Yes, Kit said and coughed a bit. But they're not here. Maybe they'll wash up here too, Violet said. Maybe, Kit said uncertainly. And maybe Dewey will join us too. We need as many associates as we can if we're going to return to the world and make sure that justice is served. But first, let's find this colony I've heard so much about. I need a shower and a hot meal. And then I want to hear the whole story of what happened to you. She started to lower herself down from the raft, but then stopped with a cry of pain. You shouldn't move, Violet said quickly, glad for an excuse to keep Kit on the coastal shelf. Your foot's been injured. Both my feet have been injured, Kit corrected ruefully, lying back down on the raft. The telegram device fell on my legs when the submarine was attacked. I need your help, Baudelaire's. I need to be someplace safe. We'll do everything we can, Klaus said. Maybe help is on the way, Kit said. I can see someone coming. The Baudelaire's turned to look, and in the dark, they saw a very tiny, very bright light skittering toward them from the west. At first, the light looked like nothing more than a firefly darting here and there on the coastal shelf, but gradually, the children could see it was a flashlight around which several figures in white robes huddled, walking carefully among the puddles and debris. The shine of the flashlight reminded Klaus of all the nights he spent reading under the covers in the Baudelaire mansion, while outside the night made mysterious noises his parents always insisted were nothing more than the wind, even on windless evenings. Some mornings his father would come into Klaus's room to wake him up and find him asleep still clutching his flashlight in one hand and his book in the other. And as the flashlight drew closer and closer, the middle Baudelaire could not help think but that it was his father walking across the coastal shelf to come to his children's aid after all this time. But of course, it was not the Baudelaire's father. The figures arrived at the cube of books, and the children could see the faces of two islanders, Finn, who was holding the flashlight, and Erewhon, who was carrying a large covered basket. "'Good evening, Baudelaire's,' Finn said. In the dim light of the flashlight, she looked even younger than she was. "'We brought you some supper,' Erewhon said, and held out the basket to the children. "'We were concerned you might be quite hungry out here.' "'We are,' Violet admitted." The Baudelaire's, of course, wished that the islanders had expressed their concern in front of Ishmael and the others when the colony was deciding to abandon the children on the coastal shelf, but as Finn opened the basket and the children smelled the island's customary dinner of onion soup, the children did not want to look a gift horse in the mouth, a phrase which here means turn down an offer of a hot meal no matter how disappointed they were in the person who was offering it. "'Is there enough for our friend?' Klaus asked. "'She's regained consciousness.' "'I'm glad to hear it,' Finn said." There's enough food for everyone. As long as you keep the secret of our coming here, Erewhon said, Ishmael might not think it was proper. I'm surprised he doesn't forbid the use of flashlights, Violet said as Finn handed her a coconut shell full of steaming soup. Ishmael doesn't forbid anything, Finn said. He'd never force me to throw away this flashlight. However, he did suggest that I let the sheep take it to the arboretum. But instead I slipped it into my robe as a secret, and Madame Nordoff has been secretly supplying me with batteries in exchange for my secretly teaching her how to yodel, which Ishmael says might frighten the other islanders. Mrs. Caliban secretly slipped me this picnic basket, Erewhon said, in exchange for my secretly teaching her the backstroke, which Ishmael says is not the customary way to swim. Mrs. Caliban? said Kit in the darkness. Miranda Caliban is here? Yes, Finn said. Do you know her? I know her husband, Kit said. He and I stood together in a time of great struggle and we're still very good friends. Your friend must be a little confused after her difficult journey, Erewhon said to the Baudelaire standing on tiptoes so she could hand Kit some soup. Mrs. Caliban's husband perished many years ago in the storm that brought her here. That's impossible, Kit said, reaching down to take the bowl from the young girl. I just had Turkish coffee with him. Mrs. Caliban is not the sort to keep secrets, Finn said. That's why she lives on the island. It's a safe place, far from the treachery of the world. Enigmorama, Sunny said, putting her coconut shell of soup on the ground so she could share it with the incredibly deadly viper. My sister means that it seems this island has plenty of secrets, Klaus said, thinking wistfully of his commonplace book and all the secrets its pages contained. I'm afraid we have one more secret to discuss, Erewhon said. Turn the flashlight off, Finn. We don't want to be seen from the island. Finn nodded and turned the flashlight off. The Baudelaire's had one last glimpse of each other before the darkness engulfed them, and for a moment everyone stood in silence as if afraid to speak. Many, many years ago, 
when even the great-great-grandparents of the oldest person you know were not even day-old infants, and when the city where the Baudelaire's were born was nothing more than a handful of dirt huts, and the Hotel de Numont nothing but an architectural sketch, and the faraway island had a name and was not considered very far away at all, there was a group of people known as the Sumerians. Sim they were a nomadic people, which meant that they traveled constantly, and they often traveled at night when the sun would not give them sunburn and when the coastal shelves in the area in which they lived were not flooded with water. Because they traveled in shadows, few people ever got a good look at the Sumerians, and they were considered sneaky and mysterious people. And to this day, things done in the dark tend to have a somewhat sinister reputation. A man digging a hole in his backyard during the afternoon, for instance, might look like a gardener. But a man digging a hole at night looks like he's burying some terrible secret. And a woman who gazes out of her window in the daytime appears to be enjoying the view, but looks more like a spy if she waits until nightfall. The nighttime digger might actually be planting a tree to surprise his niece while the niece giggles at him from the window. And the morning window watcher may actually be planning to blackmail the so-called gardener as he buries the evidence of his vicious crimes. But thanks to the Sumerians, the darkness makes even the most innocent of activities seem suspicious. And so in the darkness of the coastal shelf, the Bodler suspected that the question Finn asked was a sinister one, even though it might have been something one of their teachers might have asked in the classroom. Do you know the meaning of the word mutiny? she asked in a calm, quiet voice. Violet and Sonny knew that Klaus would answer, although they were pretty sure themselves what the word meant. A mutiny is when a group of people take action against a leader. Yes, Finn said. Professor Fletcher taught me that word. We are here to tell you that a mutiny will take place at breakfast, said Erewhon. More and more colonists are getting sick and tired of the way things are going on the island, and Ishmael is the root of that trouble. Tuber? Sonny asked. Root of the trouble means the cause of the islanders' problems, Klaus explained. Exactly, Erewhon said. And when decision day arrives, we will finally have the opportunity to get rid of him. Rid of him? Violet repeated, the phrase sounding so sinister in the dark. We're going to force him aboard the outrigger right after breakfast, Erewhon said, and push him out to sea as the coastal shelf floods. A man traveling the ocean alone is unlikely to survive, Klaus said. He won't be alone, Finn said. A number of islanders support Ishmael. If necessary, we'll force them to leave the island as well. How many? Sonny asked. It's hard to know who supports Ishmael and who does not, Erewhon said, and the children heard the old woman sip from her seashell. You've seen how he acts. You say he, he says he doesn't force anyone, but everyone ends up agreeing with him anyway. But no longer... At breakfast, we'll find out who supports him and who does not. Erewhon says we'll fight all day and all night if we have to, Finn said. Everyone will have to choose sides. The children heard an enormous, sad sigh from the top of the raft of books. <sighs> Schism, Kit said quietly. Gesundheit, Erewhon said. That's why we've come to you, Baudelaire's. We need all the help we can get. After the way Ishmael abandoned you, we figured you'd be on our side, Finn said. Don't you agree he's the root of the trouble? The Baudelaire's stood together in the silence, thinking about Ishmael and all they knew about him. They thought of the way he had taken them in so kindly upon their arrival on the island, but also how quickly he had abandoned them on the coastal shelf. They thought about how eager he had been to keep the Baudelaire safe, but also how eager he was to lock Count Olaf in a birdcage. They thought about his dishonesty about his injured feet, and about his secret apple eating. But as the children thought of all they knew about the facilitator, they also thought about how much they didn't know. And after hearing both Count Olaf and Kit Snicket talk about the history of the island, the Baudelaire orphans realized they did not know the whole story. The children might agree that Ishmael was the root of the trouble, but they could not be sure. I don't know, Violet said. You don't know? Erewhon repeated incredulously. We brought you supper, and Ishmael left you out here to starve, and you don't know whose side you're on? We trusted you when you said Count Olaf was a terrible person, Finn said. Why can't you trust us, Baudelaire's? Forcing Ishmael to leave the island seems a bit drastic, Klaus said. It's a bit drastic to put a man in a cage, Erewhon pointed out, but I didn't hear you complaining then. Quid pro quo? Sonny asked. 
If we help you, Violet translated, will you help Kit? Our friend is injured, Klaus said, injured and pregnant. And distraught, Kit added weakly from the top of the raft. If you help us in our plan to defeat Ishmael, Finn promised, we'll get her to a safe place. And if not, Sunny asked. We won't force you, Baudelaire's, Erewhon said, sounding like the facilitator she wanted to defeat. But decision day is approaching and the coastal shelf will flood. You need to make a choice. The Baudelaire's did not say anything, and for a moment everyone stood in a silence broken only by Count Olaf's snores. Violet, Klaus, and Sunny were not interested in being part of a schism after witnessing all of the misery that followed the schism of VFD, but they did not see a way to avoid it. Finn had said they needed to make a choice, but choosing between living alone on a coastal shelf, endangering themselves and their injured friend, and participating in the island's mutinous plan did not feel like much of a choice at all, and they wondered how many other people had felt this way during the countless schisms that had divided the world over the years. "'We'll help you,' Violet said finally. "'What do you want us to do?' "'We need you to sneak into the Arboretum,' Finn said. "'You mentioned your mechanical abilities, Violet, and Klaus seems very well read. "'All of the forbidden items we've scavenged over the years should come in very handy indeed. "'Even the baby should be able to cook something up,' Erewhon said. "'But what do you mean?' Klaus asked. "'What should we do with all the detritus?' "'We need weapons, of course,' Erewhon said in the darkness. "'We hope to force Ishmael off the island peacefully,' Finn said quickly, "'but Erewhon says we'll need weapons just in case. "'Ishmael will notice if we go to the far side of the island, "'but you three should be able to sneak over the Bray, "'find or build some weapons in the Arboretum, "'and bring them to us here before breakfast "'so we can begin the mutiny.' "'Absolutely not!' cried Kit from the top of the raft. "'I will not hear of you putting your talents "'to such nefarious use, Baudelaire's. "'I'm sure the island can resolve its difficulties "'without resorting to violence.' Did you solve your difficulties without resorting to violence? Erewhon asked sharply. Is that how you survived the great struggle you mentioned and ended up shipwrecked on a raft of books? My history is not important, Kit replied. I'm worried about the Baudelaire's. And we're worried about you, Kit, Violet said. We need as many associates as we can if we're going to return to the world and make sure that justice is served. You need to be in a safe place to recuperate from your injury, Klaus said. And baby, said Sunny. That's no reason to engage in treachery, Kit said, but she did not sound so sure. Her voice was weak and faint, and the children heard the books rustling as she moved her injured feet uncomfortably. Please help us, Finn said, and we'll help your friend. There must be a weapon that can threaten Ishmael and his supporters, Erewhon said, and now she did not sound like Ishmael. The Baudelaire's had heard almost the exact same words out of the imprisoned mouth of Count Olaf and they shuddered to think of the weapon he was hiding in the birdcage. Violet put down her empty soup bowl and picked up her baby sister while Klaus took the flashlight from the old woman. We'll be back as soon as we can, Kit, the eldest Baudelaire promised. Wish us luck. The raft trembled as Kit uttered a long, sad sigh. Good luck, she said finally. I wish things were different, Baudelaire's. So do we. Klaus replied, and the three children followed the narrow beam of the flashlight back toward the colony that had abandoned them. Their footsteps made small splashes on the coastal shelf, and the Baudelaire's heard the quiet slither of the incredibly deadly viper loyally following them on their errand. There was no sign of a moon, and the stars were covered in clouds that remained from the passing storm, or perhaps were heralding a new one, so the entire world seemed to vanish outside the secret flashlight's forbidden light. With each damp and uncertain step, the children felt heavier, as if their thoughts were stones that they had to carry to the Arboretum, where all the forbidden items lay waiting for them. They thought about the islanders and the mutinous schism that would soon divide the colony in two. They thought about Ishmael, and wondered whether his secrets and deceptions meant that he deserved to be at sea. And they thought about the medusoid mycelium fermenting in the helmet in Olaf's grasp, and wondered if the islanders would discover that weapon before the Baudelaire's built another. The children traveled in the dark, just as so many other people had done before them. From the nomadic travels of the Sum Sumerians, to the desperate voyages of the Quagmire triplets, who at that very moment were in circumstances just as dark, although quite a bit damper, than the Baudelaire's. And as the children grew drew closer and closer to the island that had abandoned them, and their thoughts made them heavier and heavier, the Baudelaire orphans wished things were very different indeed. 
the end of chapter eight. Let me catch up. Hey, A Rocks. This is a great stream night. Yay. Glad to have you here, Paige. He eats cookies at everyone. Yay, cookies. Thank you for that host hammer. I hope you're doing well. You guys have to go back to part one. Okay, bye, Trey. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the claps. <laughs> you can be a spy looking out your window during the day. Yeah. Such nefarious uses. That, there we go. That was me trying to be that emote, but nailed it. Thank you. I hope that the music is okay. I felt like it was too loud, so then I cut it down. And then when I cut it down, I felt like it was too quiet, so I tried to split the difference. All right, two more chapters to get through. <clears throat> okay, cool, thanks. Chapter nine. The phrase, in the dark, as I'm sure you know, can refer not only to one's shadowy surroundings, but also to the shadowy secrets of which one might be unaware. Every day, the sun goes down all over these secrets, and so everyone is in the dark in one way or another. If you are sunbathing in a park, for instance, but you do not know that a locked cabinet is buried 50 feet beneath your blanket, then you are in the dark even though you are not actually in the dark. Whereas if you are on a midnight hike, knowing full well that several ballerinas are following close behind you, then you are not in the dark even if you are in fact in the dark. Of course, it is quite possible to be in the dark in the dark, as well as to be not in the dark not in the dark, but there are so many secrets in the world that it is likely that you are always in the dark about one thing or another. Whether you are in the dark in the dark or in the dark not in the dark, although the sun can go down so quickly that you may be in the dark about being in the dark in the dark, only to look around and find yourself no longer in the dark about being in the dark in the dark, but in the dark in the dark nonetheless, not only because of the dark, but because of the ballerinas in the dark, who are not in the dark about the dark, but also not in the dark about the locked cabinet. And you may be in the dark about the ballerinas digging up the locked cabinet in the dark, even though you are no longer in the dark about being in the dark. And so you are in fact in the dark about being in the dark, even though you are not in the dark about being in the dark. And so you may, ha and so you may fall into the hole that the ballerinas have dug, which is dark, in the dark, and in the park. The Baudelaire orphans, of course, had been in the dark many times before they had made their way in the dark over the Bray to the far side of the island, where the Arboretum guarded its many, many secrets. There was the darkness of Count Olaf's gloomy house, and the darkness of the movie theater where Uncle Monty had taken them to see a wonderful film called Zombies in the Snow. There were the dark clouds of Hurricane Herman as it roared across Lake Lacrimose, and the darkness of the finite forest as a train had taken the children to work at Lucky Smell's Lumber Mill. There were the dark nights the children spent at Prufrock Preparatory School, participating in special orphan running exercises, and the dark climbs up the elevator shaft of 667 Dark Avenue. There was a dark jail cell in which the children spent some time while living in the village of foul devotees, and the dark trunk of Count Olaf's car, which had carried them from Heimlich Hospital to the Hinterlands, where the dark tents of the Caligari Carnival awaited them. There was the dark pit they had built high in the Mortmain Mountains and the dark hatch they had climbed through in order to board the Queequeg, and the dark lobby of the Hotel Denouement where they thought their dark days might be over. There were the dark eyes of Count Olaf and his associates, and the dark notebooks of the Quagmire triplets, and all of the dark passageways the children had discovered that led to the Baudelaire Mansion and out of the Library of Records and up to the VFD headquarters and to the dark, dark depths of the sea and all the dark passageways they hadn't discovered, where other people traveled on equally desperate errands. But most of all, the Baudelaire orphans had been in the dark about their own sad history. 
They did not understand how Count Olaf had entered their lives or how he had managed to remain there, hatching scheme after scheme without anyone stopping him. They did not understand VFD, even when they had joined the organization themselves, or how the organization, with all of its codes, errands, and volunteers, had failed to defeat the wicked people who seemed to triumph again and again, leaving each safe place in ruins. And they did not understand how they could lose their parents and their home in a fire, and how this enormous injustice, this bad beginning to their sad story, was followed only by another injustice, and another and another. The Baudelaire orphans did not understand how injustice and treachery could prosper even this far from their home on an island in the middle of a vast sea, and that happiness and innocence, the happiness and innocence of that day on Briny Beach before Mr. Poe brought them the dreadful news, could always be so far out of reach. The Baudelaires were in the dark about the mystery of their own lives, which is why it is such a profound shock to think at last that these mysteries might be solved. The Baudelaire orphans blinked in the rising sun and gazed at the expanse of the Arboretum and wondered if they might not be in the dark any longer. Library is another word that can mean two different things, which means even in a library you cannot be safe from the confusion and mystery of the world. The most common use of the word library, of course, refers to a collection of books or documents, such as the libraries the Baudelaires had encountered during their travels and troubles, from the legal library of Justice Strauss to the Hotel de Noumont, which was itself an enormous library, with, it turned out, another library hidden nearby. But the word library can also refer to a mass of knowledge or a source of learning, just as Klaus Baudelaire is something of a library with the mass of knowledge stored in his brain, or Kit Snicket, who was a source of learning for the Baudelaires as she told them about VFD and its noble errands. So when I write that the Baudelaire orphans had found themselves in the largest library they had ever seen, it is that definition of the word I am using, because the Arboretum was an enormous mass of knowledge and a source of learning, even without a single scrap of paper in sight. The items that had washed up on the shores of the island over the years could answer any question the Baudelaires had, and thousands more questions they'd never thought of. Stretched out as far as the eye could see were piles of objects, heaps of items, towers of evidence, bales of materials, clusters of details, stacks of stu substances, hordes of pieces, arrays of articles, constellations of details, galaxies of stuff, and universes of things. An accumulation, an aggregation, a compilation, a concentration, a crowd, a herd, a flock, and a register of seemingly everything on Earth. There was everything the alphabet could hold. Automobiles and alarm clocks, bandages and beads, cables and chimneys, discs and dominoes, earmuffs and emery boards, fiddles and fabric, garrets and glassware, Hangers and husks, icons and instruments, jewelry and jogging shoes, kites and kernels, levers and lawn chairs, machines and magnets, noisemakers and needles, orthodontics and ottomans, pull toys and pillars, quarters and quivers, race cars and rucksacks, saws and skulls, teaspoons and ties, urns and ukuleles, valentines and vines, wigs and wires, xeranthemums and xylorimbas, Yachts and yokes, zithers and zabras, a word which here means small boats usually used off the coasts of Spain and Portugal, as well as everything that could hold the alphabet, from a cardboard box perfect for storing 26 wooden blocks, to a chalkboard perfect for writing 26 letters. There were any number, number of things, from a single motorcycle to countless chopsticks, and things with every number on them, from license plates to calculators. There were objects from every climate, from snowshoes to ceiling fans, and for every occasion, from menorahs to soccer balls. And there were things you could use on certain occasions in certain climates, such as a waterproof fondue set. There were inserts in outhouses, overpasses and underclothes, upholstery and down comforters, hot plates and cold creams and cradles and coffins, hopelessly destroyed, somewhat damaged, in slight disrepair, and brand new. There were objects the Baudelaires recognized, including a triangular picture frame and a brass lamp in the shape of a fish, and there were objects the Baudelaires had never seen before, including the skeleton of an elephant and a glittering green mask one might wear as part of a dragonfly costume, 
and there were objects the Baudelaire's did not know if they had seen before, such as a wooden rocking horse and a piece of rubber that looked like a fan belt. There were items that seemed to be part of the Baudelaire's story, such as a plastic replica of a clown and a broken telegraph pole, and there were items that seemed to be part of some other story, such as a carving of a black bird and a gem that shone like an Indian moon. And all the items and all their stories were scattered across the landscape in such a way that the Baudelaire orphans thought that the Arboretum had either been organized according to principles so mysterious they could not be discovered, or it had not been organized at all. In short, the Baudelaire orphans had found themselves in the largest library they'd ever seen, but they did not know where to begin their research. The children stood in awed silence and surveyed the endless landscape of objects and stories and then looked up at the largest object at all, of all, which towered over the arboretum and covered it in shade. It was the apple tree, with a trunk as enormous as a mansion and branches as long as a city street, which sheltered the library from the frequent storms and offered its bitter apples to anyone who dared to pick one. Words fail me, Sonny said in a hushed whisper. Me too, Klaus agreed. I cannot believe what we're seeing. The islanders told us that everything eventually washes up on these shores, but I never imagined the Arboretum would hold so many things. Violet picked up an item that lay at her feet, a pink ribbon decorated with plastic daisies and began to wind it around her hair. To those who hadn't been around Violet long, nothing would have seemed unusual, but those who knew her well knew that when she tied her hair up in a ribbon to keep it out of her eyes, it meant that the gears and levers of her inventing brain were whirring at top speed. Think of what I could build here, she said. I could build splints for Kit's feet, a boat to take us off the island, a, a filtration system we could drink some fresh water. Her voice trailed off and she stared up at the branches of the tree. I could invent anything and everything. Klaus picked up the object at his feet, a cape made of scarlet silk, and held it in his hands. There must be countless secrets in a place like this, he said. Even without a book, I could investigate anything and everything. Sunny looked around her. Service a la Russe, she said, which meant something like, even with the simplest of ingredients, I could prepare an extremely elaborate meal. I, I don't know where to begin, Violet said, running a hand along a pile of broken white wood that looked like it had once been part of a gazebo. We begin with weapons, Klaus said grimly. That's why we're here. Erewhon and Finn are waiting for us to help them mutiny against Ishmael. The oldest Baudelaire shook her head. It doesn't seem right, she said. We can't use a place like this to start a schism. Maybe a schism is necessary, Klaus said. There are millions of items here that could help the colony, but thanks to Ishmael, they've all been abandoned here. No one forced anyone to abandon anything, Violet said. Peer pressure, Sunny pointed out. We can try a little peer pressure of our own, Violet said firmly. We've defeated worse people than Ishmael with far fewer materials. But do we really want to defeat Ishmael? Klaus asked. He's made the island a safe place, even if it is a little boring, and he kept Count Olaf away, even if he is a little cruel. He is feet of clay, but I'm not sure he's the root of the problem. What is the root of the problem? Violet asked. Ink, Sunny said, but when her siblings turned to give her a quizzical look, they saw that the youngest Baudelaire was not answering their question, but pointing at the incredibly deadly viper, who was slithering hurriedly away from the children with its eyes darting this way and that, and its tongue extended to sniff like, sniff the air. It appears to know where it's going, Violet said. Maybe it's been here before, Klaus said. Tail it, Sunny said, which meant let's follow the reptile and see where it heads. Without waiting to see whether her siblings agreed, she hurried after the snake, and Violet and Klaus hurried after her. The viper's path was as curved and twisted as the snake itself, and the Baudelaire's found themselves scrambling over all sorts of discarded items, from a cardboard box soaked through from the storm that was full of something white and lacy, to a painted backdrop of a sunset, such as might be used in the performance of an opera. The children could tell that the path had been traveled before as the ground was covered in footprints. The snake was slithering so quickly that the Baudelaire's could not keep up, but they could follow the footprints, which were dusted around the edges in white powder. It was dried clay, of course, and in moments the children reached the end of the path following in Ishmael's footsteps, and they arrived at the base of the apple tree just in time to see the tail of the snake disappear into a gap in the tree's roots. 
If you've ever stood at the base of an old tree, then you know the roots are often close to the surface of the earth, and the curved angles of the roots can create a hollow space in the tree's trunk. It was into this hollow space that the incredibly deadly viper disappeared, and after the tiniest of pauses, it was into this space that the Baudelaire orphans followed, wondering what secrets they would find at the root of the tree that sheltered such a mysterious place. First Violet, then Klaus, and then Sunny stepped down through the gap into the secret space. It was dark underneath the roots of the tree, and for a moment the Baudelaire's tried to adjust to the gloom and figure out what this place was. But then the middle Baudelaire remembered the flashlight and turned it on, so he and his siblings would no longer be in the dark in the dark. The Baudelaire orphans were standing in a space much bigger than they would have imagined and much better furnished. Along one wall was a large stone bench lined with simple, clean tools, including several sharp-looking razor blades, a glass pot of paste, and several wooden brushes with narrow, fine tips. Next to the wall was an enormous bookcase, which was stuffed with books of all shapes and sizes, as well as assorted documents that were stacked, rolled, and stapled with extreme care. The shelves of the bookcase stretched away from the children past the beam of the flashlight and disappeared into the darkness, so there was no way of knowing how long the bookcase was or the number of books and documents it contained. Opposite the bookcase stretched an elaborate kitchen with a huge pot-bellied stove, several porcelain sinks, and a tall humming refrigerator, as well as a square wooden table covered in appliances ranging from a blender to a fondue set. Over the table hung a rack from which dangled all manner of kitchen utensils and pots, as well as sprigs of dried herbs, a variety of whole dried fish, and even a few, few cured meats, such as salami and prosciutto, an Italian ham that the Baudelaire orphans had once enjoyed at a Sicilian picnic the family had attended. Nailed to the wall was an impressive spice rack filled with jars of herbs and bottles of condiments, and a cupboard with glass doors through which the children could see piles of plates, bowls, and mugs. Finally, in the center of this enormous space were two large, comfortable reading chairs, one with a gigantic book on the seat, much taller than an atlas, and much thicker than even an unabridged dictionary, and the other just waiting for someone to sit down. Lastly, there was a curious device, made of brass, that looked like a large tube with a pair of binoculars at the bottom, which rose up into the thick canopy of roots that formed the ceiling. As the incredibly deadly viper hissed proudly, the way a dog might wag its tail after performing a difficult trick, the three children stared around the room each concentrating on their area of expertise, a phrase which here means the part of the room in which each Baudelaire would like to spend the most time. Violet walked over to the brass device and peered into the eyes of the binoculars. I can see the ocean, she said in surprise. This is an enormous periscope, much bigger than the one in the Queequeg. It must run all the way up to the trunk of the tree and jut out over the highest branch. But why would you want to look at the ocean from here? Klaus asked. From this height, Violet explained, you could see any storm clouds that might be heading this way. This is how Ishmael predicts the weather, not by magic, but with scientific equipment. These tools are used to repair books, Klaus said. Of course books wash up on the island, everything does eventually, but the pages and bindings of the books are often damaged by the storm that brought them, so Ishmael repairs them and shelves them here. He picked up a dark blue notebook from the bench and held it up. This is my commonplace book, he said. He must have been making sure none of the pages were wet. Sunny picked up a familiar object from the wooden table, her whisk, and held it to her nose. Fritters, she said, with cinnamon. Ishmael walks to the arboretum to watch for storms, read books, and cook spiced food, Violet said. Why would he pretend to be an injured facilitator who predicts the weather through magic, claims the island has no library, and prefers bland meals? Klaus walked to the two reading chairs and lifted the heavy, thick book. Maybe this will tell us, he said, and shone the flashlight so his sisters could see the long, somewhat wordy title printed on the front cover. What does it mean? Violet asked. That title could mean anything. Klaus noticed a thin piece of black cloth stuck in the book to mark someone's place and opened the book to that page. The bookmark was Violet's hair ribbon, which the eldest Baudelaire quickly grabbed as the pink ribbon with plastic daisies was not to her taste. I think it's a history of the island, Klaus said, written, written like a diary. Look, here's what the most recent entry says. Yet another figure from the shadowy past has washed ashore. Kit Snicket, see page 667. Convince the others to abandon her and the Baudelaire's who, I, who have already rocked the boat far too much, I fear. 
also managed to have Count Olaf locked in a cage. Note to self, why won't anyone call me Ish? Ishmael said he'd never heard the heard of Kit Snicket, Violet said, but here he writes that she's a figure from the shadowy past. 667? Sonny said, and Klaus nodded. Handing the flashlight to his older sister, he quickly turned the pages of the book, flipping back in history until he reached the page Ishmael had mentioned. Inky has learned to lasso sheep, Klaus read, and last night's storm washed up a postcard from Kit Snicket addressed to Olivia Caliban. Kit, of course, is the sister of... The middle Baudelaire's voice trailed off, and his sisters stared at him curiously. What's wrong, Klaus? Violet asked. That entry doesn't seem particularly mysterious. It's not the entry, Klaus said so quietly that Violet and Sunny could scarcely hear him. It's the handwriting. Familia? Sunny asked, and all three Baudelaire stepped as close as they could to one another. In the silence, the children gathered around the beam of the flashlight as if it were a warm campfire on a freezing night, and gazed down at the pages of the oddly titled book. Even the incredibly deadly viper crawled up to perch on Sunny's shoulders, as if it were as curious as the Baudelaire orphans to know who'd written those words so long ago. "'Yes, Baudelaire,' said a voice from the far end of the room. "'That's your mother's handwriting.'" That's the end of chapter nine. Mother's handwriting. In the dark, dark of the dark with the dark, 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 dark. This all makes sense. Totally. Who doesn't go walking in the dark with ballerinas? I know I do. Gotta. It's a weekly thing. Darkly darkening into the darkness. <laughs> with who's it's and what's it's galore. You want thing of mobs? I have a feeling I'm going to sing that song multiple times with this book. Adventure! Yeah. Okay. I'm going to step away for about 60 seconds. I just need to run to the restroom. And I'll be right back for chapter 10, which will be the last chapter that we read tonight. So I'll be right back. Uh, see you guys in just a second. And I'll... Um, be right back. Okay, bye. Okay, I'm back. <clears throat> Alright. One more chapter, shall we? I'm trying to figure out how many pages this one is. Mm, about 25. Uno mas. Hey, Morta, how are you? You caught me in time for the last chapter today. <clears throat> My week's going pretty good. Pretty good. I can't wait for this week to be over, though, because I go on vacation on Monday, and I can't wait. Okay. Chapter 10. Ishmael stepped out of the darkness, running a hand along the shelves of the bookcase, and walked slowly toward the Baudelaire orphans. In the dim glow of the flashlight, the children could not tell if the facilitator was smiling or frowning through his wild, woolly beard, and Violet was reminded of something she'd almost entirely forgotten. A long time ago, before Sonny was born, Violet and Klaus had begun an argument at breakfast over whose turn it was to take out the garbage. It was a silly matter, but one of those occasions when the people arguing are having too much fun to stop, and all day the two siblings had wandered around the house doing their assigned chores and scarcely speaking to each other. Finally, after a long, silent meal, during which their parents tried to get them to reconcile, 
a word which here means admit that it didn't matter in the slightest whose turn it was, and the only important thing was to get the garbage out of the kitchen before the smell spread to the entire mansion. Violet and Klaus were sent up to bed without dessert or even five minutes of reading. Suddenly, just as she was dropping off to sleep, Violet had an idea for an invention that meant no one would ever have to take out the garbage, and she turned on a light and began to sketch out her idea on a pad of paper. She became so interested in her invention that she did not listen for footsteps in the hallway outside, and so when her mother opened the door, she did not have time to turn out the light and pretend to be asleep. Violet stared at her mother, and her mother stared back, and in the dim light, the eldest Baudelaire could not see if her mother was smiling or frowning, if she was angry at Violet for staying up past her bedtime, or if she didn't mind after all. But then finally, Violet saw her mother was carrying a cup of hot tea. "'Here you go, dear,' she said gently. "'I know how star anise tea helps you, helps you think.' Violet took the steaming cup from her mother, and in that instant she suddenly realized it had been her turn to take out the garbage after all. Ishmael did not offer the Baudelaire orphans any tea, and when he flicked a switch on the wall and lit up the secret space underneath the apple tree with electric lights, the children could see that he was neither smiling nor frowning, but exhibiting a strange combination of the two, as if he were as nervous about the Baudelaires as they were about him. I knew you'd come here, he said finally after a long silence. It's in your blood, but I've never known a Baudelaire who didn't rock the boat. The Baudelaires felt all of their questions bump into each other in their heads, like frantic sailors deserting a sinking ship. What is this place? Violet asked. How did you know our parents? Why have you lied to us about so many things? Klaus demanded. Why are you keeping so many secrets? Who are you? Sonny asked. Ishmael took another step closer to the Baudelaire's and gazed down at Sonny, who gazed back at the facilitator, then stared down at the clay still packed around his feet. Did you know I used to be a school teacher? He asked. This was many years ago in the city. There were always a few children in my chemistry class who had the same gleam in their eyes that you Baudelaire's have. Those students always turned in the most interesting assignments. He sighed and sat down on one of the reading chairs in the center of the room. They also always gave me the most trouble. I remember one child in particular who had scraggly dark hair and just one eyebrow. Count Olaf, Violet said. Ishmael frowned and blinked at the eldest Baudelaire. No, he said. This was a little girl. She had one eyebrow and thanks to an accident in her grandfather's laboratory, only one ear. She was an orphan, and she lived with her siblings in a house owned by a terrible woman, a violent drunkard who was famous for having killed a man in her youth with nothing but her bare hands and a very ripe cantaloupe. The cantaloupe was grown on a farm that's no longer in operation, the Lucky Smells Melon Farm, which was owned by Sir, Klaus said. Ishmael frowned again. No, he said. The farm was owned by two brothers one of whom was later murdered in a small village where three innocent children were accused of the crime. Jacques, Sonny said. No, Ishmael said with another frown. There was some argument about his name, actually, as he appeared to use several names depending on what he was wearing. In any case, the student in my class began to be very suspicious about the tea her guardian would pour for her when she got home from school. Rather than drink it, she would dump it into a houseplant that had been used to decorate a well-known stylish restaurant with a fish theme. Cafe Salmonella, Violet said. No, Ishmael said and frowned once more. The bistro smelt. Of course, my student realized she couldn't keep feeding tea to the houseplant, particularly after it withered away and the houseplant's owner was whisked off to Peru aboard a mysterious ship. The Prospero, Klaus said. Ishmael offered the youngsters yet another frown. Yes, he said, although at the time the ship was called the Pericles. But my student didn't know that. She only wanted to avoid being poisoned, and I had an idea that an antidote might be hidden. Yaw, Sunny interrupted, and her siblings nodded in agreement. By yaw, the youngest Baudelaire meant Ishmael's story is tan tangential, a word which here means answering questions other than the ones the Baudelaires had asked. We want to know what's going on here on the island at this very moment, Violet said, not what happened in a classroom many years ago. But what is happening now and what happened then are part of the same story, Ishmael said. 
If I don't tell you how I came to prefer tea that's bitter as wormwood, then you won't know how I came to have a very important conversation with a waiter in a lakeside town. And if I don't tell you about that conversation, then you won't know how I ended up on a certain bath escape, or how I ended up shipwrecked here, or how I came to meet your parents, or anything else contained in this book. He took the heavy volume from Klaus's hands and ran his fingers along the spine where the long, somewhat wordy title was printed in gold block letters. People have been writing stories in this book since the first castaways washed up on the island, and all the stories are connected in one way or another. If you ask one question, it will lead you to another and another and another. It's like peeling an onion. But you can't read every story and answer every question, Klaus said, even if you'd like to. Ishmael smiled and tugged at his beard. That's just what your parents told me, he said. When I arrived here, they'd been on the island a few months, but they'd become the colony's facilitators and had suggested some new customs. Your father had suggested that a few castaway construction workers install the periscope in the tree to search for storms, and your mother had suggested that a shipwrecked plumber device shipwrecked plumber devise a water filtration system so the colony could have fresh water right from the kitchen sink. Your parents had begun a library from all the documents that were here and were adding hundreds of stories to the commonplace book. Gourmet meals were served, and your parents had convinced some of the other castaways to expand this underground space. He gestured to the long bookshelf, which disappeared into the darkness. They wanted to try to dig a passageway that would lead to a marine research center and rhetorical advice service some miles away. The Baudelaire's exchanged amazed looks. Captain Wittershans had described such a place, and in fact, the children had spent some desperate hours in its ruined basement. You mean if we walk along the bookcase, Klaus said, we'll reach Ann Whistle Aquatics? Ismail shook his head. The passageway was never finished, he said, and it's a good thing, too. The research center was destroyed in a fire, which might have spread through the passageway and reached the island. And it turned out that a very deadly fungus was contained in that place. I shudder to think what might happen if the medusoid mycelium ever reached these shores. The Baudelaire's looked at one another again, but said nothing, preferring to keep one of their secrets even as Ishmael told them some of his own. The story of the Baudelaire children may have connected with Ishmael's story of the spores contained in the diving helmet Count Olaf was hiding under his gown in the birdcage in which he was a prisoner, but the siblings saw no reason to, to volunteer this information. Some islanders thought the passage was a wonderful idea, Ishmael continued. Your parents wanted to carry all of the documents that had washed up here to Anwistle Aquatics, where they might be sent to a sub-sub-librarian who had a secret library. Others wanted to keep the island safe, far from the treachery of the world. By the time I arrived, some islanders wanted to mutiny and abandon your parents on the coastal shelf. The facilitator heaved a great sigh and closed the heavy book in his lap. I walked into the middle of this story, he said, just as you walked into the middle of mine. Some of the islanders had found weapons in the detritus and the situation might have become violent if I hadn't convinced the colony to simply abandon your parents. We allowed them to pack a few books into a fishing boat your father had built, and in the mo morning they left with a few of their comrades as the coastal shelf flooded. They left behind everything they'd created here, from the periscope I used to predict the weather to the commonplace book where I continued their research. You drove our parents away? Violet asked in amazement. They were very sad to go, Ishmael said. Your mother was pregnant with you, Violet. And after all of their years with VFD, your parents weren't sure they wanted their children exposed to the world's treachery. But they didn't understand that if a passageway had been completed, you would have been exposed to the world's treachery in any case. Sooner or later, everyone's story has an unfortunate event or two. A schism or a death, a fire or a mutiny, the loss of a home or the destruction of a tea set. The only solution, of course, is to stay as far away from the world as possible and lead a safe, simple life. That's why you keep so many items away from the others, Klaus said. It depends on how you look at it, Ishmael said. I wanted this place to be as safe as possible, so when I became the island's facilitator, I suggested some new customs myself. I moved the colony to the other side of the island, and I trained the sheep to drag the weapons away, and then the books and the mechanical devices so none of the world's detritus would interfere with our safety. 
I suggested we all dress alike and eat the same meals to avoid any future schisms. Jojo Shoji, Sunny said, which meant something like, I don't believe that abridging the freedom of expression and the free exercise thereof is the proper way to run a community. Sunny's right, Violet said. The other islanders couldn't have agreed with these new customs. I didn't force them, Ishmael said, but of co course the coconut cordial helped. The fermented beverage is so strong that it serves as a sort of opiate for the people here. Letha? Sunny asked. An opiate is something that makes people drowsy and inactive, Klaus said, or even forgetful. The more cordial the islanders drank, Ishmael explained, the less they thought about the past or complained about the things they were missing. That's why hardly anyone leaves this place, Violet said. They're too drowsy to think about leaving. Occasionally someone leaves, Ishmael said and looked down at the incredibly deadly viper who gave him a brief hiss. Some time ago, two women sailed off with this very snake, and a few years later, a man named Thursday left with a few comrades. So Thursday is alive, Klaus said, just like Kit said. Yes, Ishmael admitted, but at my suggestion, Miranda told her daughter that he died in a storm, so she wouldn't worry about the schism that divided her parents. Electra, Sunny said, which meant a family shouldn't keep such terrible secrets, but Ishmael did not ask for a translation. Except for these troublemakers, he said, everyone has stayed here. And why shouldn't they? Most of the castaways are orphans like me and like you. I know your story, Baudelaire's, from all the newspaper articles, police reports, financial newsletters, telegrams, private correspondence, and fortune cookies that have washed up here. You've been wandering this treacherous world since your story began, and you've never found a place as safe as this one. Why don't you stay? Give up your mechanical inventions and your reading and your cooking. Forget about Count Olaf and VFD. Leave your ribbon and your commonplace book and your whisk and your raft library and lead a simple, safe life on our shores. What about Kit? Violet asked. In my experience, the Snickets are as much trouble as the Baudelaire's, Ishmael said. That's why I suggested you leave her on the coastal shelf so she wouldn't make trouble for the colony. But if you can be convinced to choose a simpler life, I suppose she can too. The Baudelaire's looked at one another doubtfully. They already knew that Kit wanted to return to the world to make sure justice was served, and as volunteers they should have been eager to join her, but Violet, Klaus, and Sunny were not sure they could abandon the first safe place they'd found, even if it was a little dull. Can't we stay here? Klaus asked and lead a more complicated life with the items and documents here in the Arboretum. And spices, Sunny added. And keep them a secret from the other islanders, Ishmael said with a frown. That's what you're doing. Klaus couldn't help pointing out. All day long you sit in your chair and make sure the island is safe from the detritus of the world, but then you sneak off to the Arboretum on your perfectly healthy feet and write in a commonplace book while snacking on bitter apples. You want everyone to lead a simple, safe life. Everyone except yourself. No one should lead the life I lead, Ishmael said with a long, sad tug on his beard. I have spent countless years cataloging all of the objects that have washed up on these shores and all the stories these objects tell. I've repaired all the documents that the storms have damaged and taken notes on every detail. I've read more of the world's treacherous history than almost anyone, and as one of my colleagues once said, this history is indeed little more than the register of crimes, follies, and misfortunes of mankind. Gibbon, Sunny said. She meant something like, we want to read this history no matter how miserable it is and her siblings were quick to translate. But Ishmael tugged at his beard again and shook his head firmly at the three children. Don't you see, he asked, I'm not just the island's facilitator, I'm the island's parent. I keep this library far away from the people under my care so they will never be disturbed by the world's terrible secrets. The facilitator reached into a pocket of his robe and held out a small object. The Baudelaire saw that it was an ornate ring emblazoned with the initial R and stared at it quite puzzled. Ishmael opened the enormous volume in his lap and turned a few pages to read from his notes. This ring, he said, once belonged to the Duchess of Winnipeg, who gave it to her daughter, who was also the Duchess of Winnipeg, who gave it to her daughter, and so on and so on and so on. Eventually, the last Duchess of Winnipeg joined VFD and gave it to Kit Snicket's brother. He gave it to your mother. For reasons I still don't understand, she gave it back to him and he gave it to Kit. 
and Kit gave it to your father, who gave it to your mother when they were married. She kept it locked in a wooden box that could only be opened by a key that was kept in a wooden box that could only be opened by a code that Kit Snicket had learned from her grandfather. The wooden box turned to ashes in the fire that destroyed the Baudelaire mansion, and Captain Widdershins found the ring in the wreckage, only to lose it in a storm at sea, which eventually washed it onto our shores. Niklot? Sunny asked, which meant, why are you telling us about this ring? The point of the story is not the ring, Ishmael said. It's the fact that you've never seen it until this moment. This ring, with its long secret history, was in your home for years, and your parents never mentioned it. Your parents never told you about the Dust Duchess of Winnipeg, or Captain Widdershins, or the Snicket siblings, or VFD. Your parents never told you they'd lived here, or that they were forced to leave, or any other details of their own unfortunate history. They never told you their whole story. Then let us read that book, Klaus said, so we can find it out for ourselves. Ishmael shook his head. You don't understand, he said, which is something the middle Baudelaire never liked to be told. Your parents didn't tell you these things because they wanted to shelter you. Just as this apple tree shelters the items in the arboretum from the island's frequent storms. And just as I shelter the colony from the complicated history of the world. No sensible parent would let their child read even the title of this dreadful, sad chronicle when they could keep them far from the treachery of the world instead. Now that you've ended up here, don't you wish to respect their wishes? He closed the book again and stood up, gazing at all three Baudelaire's in turn. Just because your parents have died, he said quietly, does not mean they have failed you. Not if you stay here and lead the life they wanted you to lead. Violet thought of her mother again, bringing the cup of star anise tea on that restless evening. Are you sure that this is what our parents would have wanted? She asked, not knowing if she could trust his answer. If they didn't want to keep you safe, he said, they would have told you everything, so you could add another chapter to this unfortunate history. He put the book down on the reading chair and put the ring in Violet's hand. You belong here, Baudelaire's, on this island and under my care. I'll tell the islanders that you've changed your minds and that you're abandoning your troublesome past. Will they support you? Violet asked, thinking of Erewhon and Finn and their plan to mutiny at breakfast. Of course they will, Ishmael said. The life we lead here on the island is better than the treachery of the world. Leave the arboretum with me, children, and you can join us for breakfast. And cordial, Klaus said. No apples, Sunny said. Ishmael gave the children one last nod and led the children up through the gaps, gap in the roots of the tree, turning off the lights as he went. The Baudelaire stepped out of the arboretum and looked one last time at the secret space. In the dim light, they could just make out the shape of the incredibly deadly viper who slithered over Ishmael's commonplace book and followed the children into the morning air. The sun filtered through the shade of the enormous apple tree and shone on the gold block letters on the spine of the book. The children wondered whether the letters had been printed there by their parents or perhaps the previous writer of the commonplace book or the writer before that or the writer before that. They wondered how many stories the oddly titled history contained and how many people had gazed at the gold lettering before paging through the previous crimes, follies, and misfortunes and adding more of their own, like the thin layers of an onion. As they walked out of the arboretum led by their clay-footed facilitator, the Baudelaire orphans wondered about their own unfortunate history and that of their parents and all the other castaways who had washed up on the shores of this island, adding chapter upon chapter to a series of unfortunate events. It's the end of chapter 10, and all I'll do for the stream tonight. It'll be short. We've only been live an hour and 10, but I don't want to be up too late tonight. I'd rather go longer tomorrow, so that's what I plan to do. Where am I going for vacation? I'm going to Florida. Ooh, a tea. I know, doesn't that sound really lovely? I read that and I was like, oh man, that sounds really good. Bare hands are quite deadly. Welcome back, Terror. Mysterious ships, best ships, maybe? Ishmael saying no is my science teacher every time I try to participate. Oh, onion book. And a fortunate event or two, why not a limo? Mixing with the real world and people? Ew. League of Legends on Twitch is an opiate then makes me feel slow and sleepy. Just thinking about it has me misspelling League. 
your perfectly healthy feet for shame. I'm also the island's best DJ. Ish blows air horn. Burr, 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 burr. They already failed in sheltering them. Yeah. He gave it to his brother, who gave it to his mother, who gave it to his daughter, who gave it to his cousin, and so on and so forth. And that, dear Baudelaire's, is how I became my own grandpa. Did at least one of them have hair of red? Oh, yeah. The widow's grown-up daughter. I'm glad you used an early line, because I certainly forgot the details later in the song. Claps for chapter 10 and stream. Oh, thanks, Riddy. Thanks for the claps. Florida's where all the normal people live. I mean, have you have you ever have you ever done the thing where you search like Florida man and then your birthday and there's always like some weird news article about some weird person in Florida that did something super weird. CJ is down there. This is true. CJ is pretty fantastic, but it's always funny to be like making fun of like the Florida man or whatever. The stereotype that is Florida man. Anyway, <laughs> so we have four more chapters to read and we'll be done with this book and done with this series, which is crazy to think about. Um, so tomorrow I will be streaming that about 4-ish p.m. Um, Eastern Standard Time. Um, so I'm going to call it here for the night. I got to get in the shower and get ready for bed because I have to be up at 5.30 for work. So... Um, have a lovely rest of the night, everybody. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate you all so much. I'm sorry, Muerta. Me too. I'm kind of sad about it, but we have other books to read and other projects to go on to, so it'll be nice to move on to something new too. Have a great Florida man gets stuck in toilet after wrestling with a goose. See, this is the entertainment that I need. <laughs> All right, everybody, good night, take care. I'll see you all shortly and soon. Thank you all for being here, and I'll catch y'all later. Bye!